Nice. 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 All right, man. Uh, I think I'm going to give you the traditional intro today because <laughs> my sampler is out. So for those of you who don't get to see it enough, here you go. Hey. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of DSLR Film New Podcast. I've got Devin here with me today. As you can see, we are a little bit haphazard this Sunday afternoon. Uh, both of us have been out on shoots, and our equipment is scattered to the wind. I personally am working off of a uh, Panasonic GX85 as a stationary <laughs> webcam, because why not, you know? And uh, that's why you can see an exposure compensation uh, indication right here. Devin, what have you been up to, man? Uh, doing a little bit of documentary shooting. I uh, was out at Santa Monica for a bit, uh, West Hollywood. I'm currently working on a documentary about some of the characters, I guess you could call them, that go out on Hollywood Boulevard and uh, ask for money to take photos with them, you know, Spider-Man and all that kind of stuff. So uh, doing a project with one of those as well as currently working with a Russian director who's trying to bring peace between Russia and America through film and art, which is an interesting concept. So uh, other than that, it's been a whole lot of posts, a whole lot of editing. Uh, I had to do one of those you know, crazy sessions where you sit down with a client and remove and and ums for like four or five hours. Oh, those are the worst. <laughs> And it's, 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 you know, the client likes it. And so if the client's willing to pay for it, great. But it's one of those that tends to be a little painful for an editor who likes to move fast and get the project done ASAP. <laughs> uh, you know, speaking of uh, Russian and American interaction, and I, I don't want to get political here as far as uh, who you're voting for or whatever, but I do want to comment on the number of political ads that have been out and the lack of quality I've been seeing in a number of those. Lighting has been awful. You can tell which candidate, and Devin, maybe you've seen some of this too in California, but uh, up here in Oregon and Washington, you watch some of these videos and you can tell which ones they actually spent a little bit of money on, uh, got a decent film crew to shoot their or their little you know a smear campaign or whatever. And then you can see the ones where it's just like this overexposed face in front of a gray background saying like, I vote for so-and-so, you know, you should too. Or the really bad one, uh, there's uh, there's prop some prop 97 or something like that out here. I, yeah, I don't know what, prop, what it's about. Yeah. But there's a doctor <laughs> reading, and you can watch his eyes like go back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> he reads a giant cue card. And yeah. you're like, what the what the hell? Who is doing this? What the heck is wrong with you? Uh, you, you see any of those on your end? Oh man, I see plenty of them. Um, I mean, I don't even watch a whole lot of uh, terrestrial, but uh, my girlfriend does. And so when I occasionally see the commercials on the TV, I just think to myself like, oh my gosh, this is literally like local commercial level quality of work, which doesn't necessarily mean good or bad, but you know what I mean when I say that, that like sometimes, oh, someone just runs out for very cheap and does a very rushed together project for some local business that doesn't want to spend a whole lot of money on a TV spot. And I'm surprised that like, you know, there's money, big presidential uh, mm -hmm. candidates and stuff like that. Uh, and this is the kind of quality of video that comes out. I guess for them, they don't necessarily attach it to their brand because it's not like a brand video for them. It's usually just a slam piece. But uh, it, it, it does kind of make you wonder, like, how do these people get these <laughs> gigs and these jobs? Like, how does this end up happening with something as grand as the presidential stage? Well, and out here, I know several filmmakers that uh, this advertising campaign season will be their moneymaker. That'll like basically supply them into the end of next year for their entire revenue. And it's like, what? what, what? You're just going to put a ring light on there and uh, shoot them in front of a gray background staring like ghosts? And oh, it's, it's ridiculous. Drives me nuts. But I think we should move on to the news. Again, no cues today, so you just get to listen to me <laughs> ramble in with the first thing that I want to talk about, and this is actually something uh, kind of interesting. We've been seeing all the stuff released for the OMD EM1 Mark II from Olympus, and this camera now has a price. Uh, we're looking at $1,999 for the base price of this, which is a little more expensive than people were expecting. And we have all the specs, and people are actually starting to get their hands on this and do pre-reviews. Devin, you've seen some of the video from this camera. You've seen some of the stills images. I know no one's been able to actually look at the raw files from this yet. What do you think about the OMD EM1 Mark II? Is, is it a good video proposition? You think Olympus is going to screw this up? I think it's a terrible name. Uh, 
because it's too damn long. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I know it's it's heritage. Uh, everything I see from it really looks great. It's reaching the point where uh, the only way I'm going to know if it's a good or bad video platform is really going to come down to usability. And that, and considering that this product isn't necessarily in the hands of the masses yet, um, that's the best place to be right now because nothing else sticks out at me as any kind of like this is going to be trouble this is something you'll have to like deal with and work around other than the usual caveats of dslr filmmaking so in this situation everything looks good for me i'm still not sure if this would be enough to make me go towards something like this considering that the gh5 has that very convenient audio package that they're coming out with and that may be kind of hard to ignore that over going for something like this but like you said the specs are good all the samples Samples we're getting looks really great. Um, that you know, and that in-body stabilization that they did on the last one, I'm sure is um, going to come out just as well in real-world use on this one. So it has a lot going for it. It seems like the video quality's finally been kicked up to a notch where you can kind of put it side by side with Panasonic's lineup and go, yeah, this is something you could consider. Um, that being said, I don't see anything that strictly takes me away from maybe the Panasonic camp in terms of like, this is a killer feature you need to have this cause it's going to help out your production. So other than that though, I'm, I'm kind of liking it. I would really like to play with one. Well, one thing I see missing from the specs and maybe I've missed this while I've been looking around, but, uh, uh Panasonic was very quick to point out 422 color space yes. in 4k. And I'm not seeing that anywhere in the specs for the uh, Olympus EM one Mark two. I would doubt they have it. You think so? You think that uh, that's not going to happen? Yeah, I I don't. I I feel like they would push it, even though they aren't a video camera right now in terms of branding and everything else. I feel like they would be pushing that, just like Panasonic is, because even though Panasonic has been tight with the details, they've released that because they know that that's a big thing that'll keep people waiting to see what their camera will do. Uh, Cause we still don't have any samples. So like, you know, nobody knows what a GH5 will look like yet, but they're putting out specs like that because they know that that helps to keep people interested until they do. Now, so in this case, oh. it's like, I'm not sure it could happen, but I didn't see those specs either. And I wouldn't be surprised if they just don't show up because in terms of samples, and I think their consumer base, which is wedding videography and stuff like that, I just don't think it's important for them. Now, one other thing I noticed, and I'll, we'll have to find out more about this, but notice here the actual uh, pixel size is 21.8 megapixels, and uh, the effective pixels is 20.4. Uh, I haven't seen anywhere where it says that there's an extra crop for 4K shooting. So are you think this is uh, 2x crop as opposed to the what 2.2 2 or 2. point Two, whatever yeah 2.3 or something like that for the panasonic i get what you're saying i maybe <laughs> uh, i mean <laughs> i think that that extra space to me the margin of extra space makes me feel like it's it could be used for that uh 4k in terms of the dci aspect ratio okay but um but in terms of, is, they say that, that those aren't effective pixels because I feel like that would be added in with effective pixels or they would just set the standardized thing to be 21. I think it's a weird aspect ratio sensor. I think that's what it's coming across as. It could be like a DCI 4K sensor, which is a weird aspect ratio that most people won't take photos at. And so therefore then it gets called a 20.4 megapixel effective uh, sensor. So it could be something like that, which would be something that they should be advertising because uh, we don't know about the GH5 yet, but on the GH4, obviously that's a stickler point. It's like, hey, it's hard to go wide if you're doing 4K, just like I was shooting with the Black Magic last weekend with its 3X crop, the pocket cinema camera, and that's really hard to get wide. You're 12 millimeters <laughs> at 36. So you're shooting indoors, trying to get wide shots. It's really impossible. So that's definitely something that could uh, get people interested, especially wedding videographers and stuff like that who think about wide lenses. And I think that Olympus has always had a priority on wide considering that they're the only ones who have made a decent wide zoom for the micro four thirds standard. Panasonic. Oh, come on. The uh, seven to 14 isn't too bad from it's <laughs> F4, but I mean, <laughs> No, it's not bad. It's just slow. And, uh, you know, Olympus really kicked its butt with a 2.8. So it, it's it's one of those that, like, I, I kind of consider with these smaller sensor cameras, you really have to look at things like 2.8 as being more of a necessity because you aren't going to get the noise performance you do from a larger sensor at this time. Technology is always improving. So for me, I kind of consider that a necessity. Shooting f4, I go, that's an outdoor lens then on a Panasonic uh, just because it's not going to do really well in the low light. 
Well, a, a micro four thirds isn't exactly a low light triumph <laughs> to begin with. The, the other thing that that extra 21 megapixel sensor, the extra unused sensor space may be uh, possibly there for, and I was think I was trying to think of reasons why that might be the case. And the other option would be maybe you needed a little bit of wiggle room for the on, on camera image stabilization. So having that extra bit of pixels around the outside means that you won't actually darken out or leave a, a gap of some kind while that sensor is floating about. Uh, the other you, thing, oh, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I was going to say, uh, yeah, I think that's totally could be the case because the further you push that sensor to yep. stay with the image, you start to run into a point where there's no sensor left. So you're totally right. I think that could be as well. The last thing on the list here, and uh, this is sort of disappointing for those of you that want to shoot anything longer than 29 minutes. Again, <laughs> we see the traditional 29 minute limit on video recording. Uh, not necessarily a format problem or anything of that nature. In fact, it's simply <laughs> an international, trade, agreement international trade agreement coming in strong again, which ironically, uh, Panasonic and a few other cameras out there have somehow managed to ignore without having any loss lawsuits filed against them. So I don't know. We'll have to wait and see on this camera. And it, it might be determined too on price. If we if we see the GH5 at the traditional $1699 or even under the $2,000 mark, that'll either That's force a sell. Olympus to drive the price further down or you know it, it may just make the Panasonic the better choice. I am not going to upgrade until I see the GH4 act or GH5 actual specs because right now I'm in a, a good spot camera wise. Don't really have any need to upgrade, but uh, I would for some color space or in body stabilization, especially since I do now own quite a bit in the way of micro four thirds lenses. And speaking of lenses, let's roll into this next one. Our favorite company, Yongyo, who makes all kinds of weird stuff, uh, especially known for their flashes and so on, uh, has ventured into the lens making business. And I believe this is the fourth lens in their lineup. Uh, they recently cloned the 35 millimeter F2 and the 50 millimeter F18. Now they are cloning the Canon uh, mount 100 millimeter F2. Uh, this budget lens will set you back about $170 versus the Canon version, which is $330. So a pretty decent savings. Devin, uh, first of all, third party lenses, I know you and I are both in agreement. Uh, we need as many extra lens choices as possible. Mm. <laughs> but are, are, are you going to recommend a set of primes uh, from Yongio for a, a new filmmaker? Is, is that a, the way to go if you want to save money? Uh, I think in uh, really for me, pr these autofocus primes and they have a place definitely in photography and a few other things. But I think people really discredit how good a, a decent zoom looks. Um, you, you look at Canon and uh, Sigma and a few of the other people who are coming out with these great zooms and you compare them side by side with primes inside of that focal length and you'd be hard pressed to really find a prime being that much more perfect, uh, especially considering the price and the struggle and everything else of these different lenses. I know for a long time people have always expressed that like primes are king and primes are the fastest lenses you can get. But I've also seen a lot of people too when you show them pictures side by side have a hard time telling you which one was shot on a prime. So I mean real world and pixel peeping and everything else that goes into this kind of stuff it is something that i would recommend um but i think kind of for that price like the roking on cine series for people who are into filmmaking and they're going to do focus pulls and all this other stuff um that may be a better option for them i mean if you're documentary and you're thinking about doing autofocus then too i'm also thinking you want to zoom because you don't know what environment you're going to be in and you want to be able to adjust focal length rapidly in order to fit the situation you're filming so this, for me, I kind of see this as a photography lens for myself because I don't see me using this necessarily with video unless I had a really good reason to. But I'm, like you said earlier, I'm totally about like third party lenses. We need to get more of them um, because even though people, you know, will say Canon is king and the L series glass and all that kind, um, when you look side by side with some of the other competitors, there's some ways that some of those competitors actually shoot a better photo in certain situations or they have less chromatic aberration or, you know, like give and take. It's not is black and white is like, oh, this is the best lens you have to have this. So uh, minus you go up to like some crazy Zeiss PL glass or something <laughs> like that, you know, because those can, yeah, are absolutely perfect. But uh, in, in this situation, I'm like, yeah, third party, because I would love to see too that uh, 
Canon and Nikon maybe start to look at competitively pricing some lenses. No, if that's not, not going to happen. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, well, period. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> and and in fact, in you know, you look at the build and design of this compared like to identical. the Canon. It looks identical to the Canon. I would guess uh, with the 35 F2 and the 51.8, uh, they're probably made in the same factories. And from the autofocus tests I've seen online, uh, they perform as you would expect, not amazing, but within range of their double the price counterparts. Uh, Yongyo is, is doing a good job, and I'm the opposite of you, Devin. I don't go to <laughs> Zooms nearly as much. In fact, sure. it, it, Devin's looked at my bag. It's usually uh, prime after prime after prime after prime, all the way up and down the focal range. Uh, I do use Zooms occasionally, but uh, very specifically, I like my... Uh, Primes, they're, they're the best. You, know, <laughs> you spend all that money on those on those pieces of glass. This guy, though, one hundred and seventy dollars. Uh, you could get the thirty-five, the fifty, and now the one hundred. That that is a good entry level range of prime lenses, and you're probably talking a price tag mm -hmm. of less than six hundred dollars. Uh, that's the price of a single uh, Rokinon Cinema lens. Uh, you know, the 35 or the 50, for example. So this could be a good starter kit. And really, you know, if you're just starting out, you don't have that much money to invest oh, anyway. Absolutely. And considering that there could be things we don't foresee right now, like, hey, maybe the autofocus isn't nearly as fast as the Canon, and um, maybe it makes a bit of noise when it's autofocusing. Those are the kind of things that you can overlook as long as you get a great image and you're just starting out and you're looking to get great images and learn how to make great images before you worry about necessarily all the little minutia of a high quality lens. You know what you can't overlook, though, Devin? It's good lighting. And that <laughs> brings me to the next bit here. Uh, this is the Life Light. If you guys remember the Luma Light from uh, maybe a year ago or so, it was a tiny little light that had a battery internally and could be controlled uh, via Wi Fi to uh, dim and change color and so on. Uh, this is basically a baby version of that. The Life Light is from the same company, uh, it's already been fully funded. They're up to 106. Uh, $1,000 right now, and they have 24 days left to go. I actually put my name in the hat for one of these. I do like their regular lights, and at a price, I believe, of around $49. It was $39 if you got in on the early bird special. Uh, this guy is still wirelessly controlled, uh, still gives you about... I want to say about 70%, 65% of the output light that you got out of the bigger brother, but at a $49 price, it's about half the price. Devin, have you used any of these tiny lights? I know I've been kind of messing around with them. <laughs> How you... many did you buy? How many? Oh did you my buy? God. Okay, so <laughs> I got I got two of these ICANN lights, those tiny little uh, pocket lights. I mm -hmm. bought the four set of these because. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so here's the deal. I. I was looking at buying a couple of these just to play with the uh, the Luma, the original Luma Cube, which is the bigger version. And they had a deal in here, and let me see if I can find it. Uh, if you bought uh, four of them, you got two of the original type and two of the <laughs> new type of right course. here. So for $199, that actually uh, is basically giving you the old Luma cubes for half price. And then you also end up with two of the, of the regular units. So hell, why not? I, I don't really necessarily have a, a dying need for them. But those little ICANN lights and a couple of the other uh, brands of tiny lights I've been playing around with, I've got, um, what is it, Aladdin, I think, is the other one mm -hmm. that makes the battery included. And you know what? They are very, very handy. Uh, I've found myself using them more than I was expecting. Uh, the ICANN lights, uh, Devin, you've probably seen this since uh, you and I have used webcams multiple times together. It, they do provide like a little bit of a weird green cast in mm -hmm. their light. Uh, some of the other ones, especially the Aladdin, I want to say it's Aladdin. I might be saying it incorrectly, but uh, Alden or something, Alden, something, something like that. Uh, that one does a really great job. The light's excellent out of it. Battery but life. But you pay is awful. for it. Yeah, you pay for it. It's a. Uh, uh, I want to say that was like five hundred bucks or four hundred bucks for that little light. But <laughs> yeah. It's nice. I mean, it does a great yeah. job. And uh, well, you, that's why I wanted to ask you on the original uh, Lumi Cube because you do have experience with that. Did you notice uh, the quality of white coming out of that light to be pretty acceptable? Yeah, it looks good. Um, the, the honest thing is I don't use it on faces unless I'm in a pinch. Uh, you, skin tones get a little wacky with it, but 
where it's really awesome is the light's so small, you just drop them around a scene like at random behind stuff and you get these nice little ghosted light effects that you, you couldn't really get with larger lights or you'd spend a lot of time dinking around with. And when it's something small, I can fit, I, I carry, current, in my current kit, I carry three flapjacks I carry one of those cheapo uh, iPad lights that you recommended, and then I carry four of these tiny lights. And with the four tiny lights, I can do all this cool background lighting that I would normally not even bother with because it's just too much work. I, just placing them around in places, dimming them, set them up to do uh, you know just different reflections. You, and stuff like that. I'm curious how you mount them. Do they have a quarter twenty in the bottom? They do. do. They fit that? Yes, then they the do. Wouldn't even fit that. That's crazy. Uh, yes. Uh, so the others, they have a quarter twenty in the bottom, which is completely reasonable to just put them on an arm and and mount them. But they're also made out of solid metal. So to actually clamp onto them, you can use the clamper portion of your arm to to hold them too. <laughs> so uh, sometimes I'll just balance two of them out on either side, uh, mm -hmm. one on the clamp and one <laughs> on the quarter twenty, uh, and it, they work fine. It's they're really handy. Uh, they're they're good. Again, I would stay away from skin tones on those. But uh, mm -hmm. for just uh, cool, creative lighting options, they're cheap lights uh, minus the Aladdin. That, that one's not cheap. But uh, the rest of them are. <laughs> and four, no, four and more of them will be a sweet addition to my kit. Plus, it um, with the creativity that you're talking about, like I totally get that for the cost because you've got a hard light source that you can cut and you can shape, you can shadow with it, um, as well as then that convenience that you aren't like, hey, let me, okay, put a panel over here, let me put a panel here, let me throw some barn doors on it, like – um, for that, it totally. And then I'm thinking of other things too. Like we typically talk about tight lighting situations, like in a car on a dash yeah. or something like that. This is the size light where I feel like with some gaff tape, I could put it up in like an A pillar, the corner of a car to mm -hmm. like light the back seat or do other stuff like that to like help shape the light. So it seems like a really exciting tool and you're making it hard for me not to pull the trigger and spend a couple hundred on a bazillion of these. Well, it's made my light, lighting situations way more creative than I normally would. Uh, I, I spend a little bit more time just doing some cool background stuff that makes it very interesting. And in the past, I would have just ignored that. So I love these things. And the other thing is charging these is awesome. I have a five-port USB charger. Uh, with a single plug and you, you just plug it in and hang all your lights off of it, uh, charge them and leave them in your bag. And I mean, for quick interviews and, and short little shots, if you set these to mid output or a little bit lower uh, power, they'll last for three or four hours without running out on you. Wow. And uh, that's really impressive. Uh, same thing with those ICANN lights, those little ICANN lights. As long as you're not running at full power, you can get two and a half hours out of that thing. And that's on the internal battery. So, you know, that's long enough to accomplish most things and rotate them through the charger in the meantime. It's, it's really impressive. I, I've been very pleasantly surprised with my experience with these tiny, tiny lights, and I'm going to continue to be an advocate for them. That Kickstarter lasts another 24 days, guys, so I, I don't get any kind of kickback for you checking that it's out. Not but sponsored. If you, not sponsored, something I bought myself. I, you can see my name on the list, $199 down the drain, possibly, for this. <laughs> uh, but they are out there. They are interesting, and it's one of the few Kickstarters that uh, – I've, I've thrown down on in the last couple of years because uh, I actually have seen their previous products and they're nice. Now, speaking of lights, this one's yours, Devin. It's a flexible light. It's not the uh, flex light that we're normally familiar with, the branded version. Uh, this looks to be a generic version for $300. Tell me more about the Brightcast. Well, this is kind of next on my block of like uh, cheap um, Chinese, or I don't know if it's Chinese. Is camera art Chinese? Is that from China? I'm not sure. But I mean, a cheap, possibly. a cheap light. Well, and we know them from like making sliders and a few other films. So this isn't like their first product, but this is kind of the first time they've entered into lighting. Most of it's been cages and rigging and map boxes and other things. So uh, it seems really intriguing. It seems like there's a lot of thought put out in this now a lot of flex lights i've seen that right now if you're looking to buy something that's not a west cup but is a flex light it tends to be garbage it tends to be like hey we found some old like uh, led strips in the back and we attached them to a piece of paper and added a remote and you know we're calling it a day um you, and usually the cri on them is terrible and they don't really consider it f like a filmmaking light they just advertise it as one uh here though um, you're getting by color and you're getting by color on each chip, which is supposed to, even though there isn't a lot of chips on there, 
it's supposed to give you by color without sacrificing light output because uh, normally half of your space is used up by the other colored LEDs. So I found that to be an interesting concept. So it may actually be more of a usable light. I really like the fact that um, it's V mount compatible, um, though, you know, I'm more of a gold mount kind of guy, so I'd use an adapter, but still being able to use those big bricks when you want to. The light seems impressive. It's flexible and it holds its shape, which some of the cheap ones don't. Um, and they advertise IP67, like throw this out in the rain. Obviously, the battery solution wouldn't necessarily work in, in a whole lot of water. But um, the other part I found really interesting is that each corner of this, uh, they're planning on having adapters so you can snap it and make a two by one or a two by two and kind of increase the size and the output of this. And so. Uh, in terms of like being able to portably run around with a giant light, and especially when that's light enough that maybe somebody, uh, you know, Ken Hollywood can hold up for you during a quick shot or something like that. Uh, I, I see a lot of that um, being very useful with this light, and it's down in that price point where I kind of start to consider it because a lot of one by one panels, which may be a little brighter than this, are already about that price. You look at um, apertures uh, size, roughly the size of the light for this one. There, um, uh, I think six thirty seven or whatever it's called. Okay. That that one runs for about. 260 right now 280 I think it was a little over 300 when it came out so it's kind of like in that range it curls up it's IP6 you can hang it you can wrap it put it in a china ball I just see a lot of usability out of it and then the fact that they're um, who knows exactly how accurate but they're advertising CRI 97 TLCI 98.1 um, and these are pretty impressive numbers for a light just in general in this price point um, that's supposed to have some uh, pretty big size. So I don't think it's going to be necessarily the brightest light for a one by one. Realistically, we're talking a thousand lux at like one meter, which to me feels a little weak compared to what else you can buy at this price range. But it's one of those where you've got to weigh uh, convenience. And then as well, um, you know, cameras don't need a lot of light. I don't know many situations where I'm running my lights at full power these days just because, unless I'm trying to bounce off a ceiling or do something I don't know. Big you, like that. you mentioned you're shooting on the black magic. So you probably <laughs> need all the light you can get. It, well, it, it's one of those, like, yeah, with like the black magic, it does struggle. You take it up to 1600 and the noise is present. But then, too, I know a lot of directors who see the noise from the black magic at 1600 and they, they think that's cool because it looks like old film stock. Film grain. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I right? love the grain. Oh, oh yeah. Man, those people. Yeah, put more it, now, in it. Devin, back up for a second. We use these terms all the time, CRI and TLCI. What do they mean? Sure. So CRI uh, became popular a while ago. It's supposed to be a way of uh, figuring out how well a, a light produces white in terms of or the white that it advertises, whether that's 3200, 5600. Most bicolor lights should be telling you a separate CRI rating for each color temperature. And they actually do on this light. But if you're looking at cheap LED lights and they only give you one CRI rating and they don't tell you for which color it is, if it's a bicolor, that's kind of like a red flag that like these guys aren't exactly checking to actually measuring how white it is. Because white as a spectrum, you know, we talk about cool white and warm white and 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin, depending on, you know, incandescent lights in the sun and everything else. And uh, there's lots of videos you can watch on the internet about that stuff. But when it comes down to like buying lighting products, that CRI is supposed to be like, okay, this is very close to the kind of white you get from the sun, which we're, as humans, we're very accustomed to and we like the way it looks on skin and everything else. And, t and then people started arguing, well, CRI isn't that accurate because there's certain ways that there could be spikes and peaks and things like that in the spectrograph that would not produce a great white but still report a high number. And that's where TLCI came in, which I believe is a European standard for measuring whiteness or something like that or it came from some kind of European broadcasting center. So uh, that's kind of why you see a lot of lights now also advertising TLCI because it's supposed to be a more accurate measurement of how good is that white. And what that really means real world used to break it down for you guys is that a low CRI of like 80 you, there might be green in it. There might be pink in it. It may not be that great when you shoot it on somebody's face. Um, I mean, just for an example, you look at my face right now, there's actually quite a bit of pink on it. And part of that's because I'm using a newer LED light, uh, newer as a brand. And the CRI for it is probably around 87. So there's kind of a weird pink coming off onto my face. And uh, even if I like kind of play with the white balance right now 
and I go towards trying to make my white walls more neutral, uh, you'll notice that it gets a very like weird pink coming off of it. And you know, the skin's looking a bit dead and it's not looking like it has a lot of life to it. And that's kind of because the CRI is pretty low. And that's kind of the byproduct of what you get. You can still use it for lighting. It's just, it won't look great. For me, most of the time, bad CRIs come up in two places and that's on the face where skin tone is kind of this thing that you instinctively know when it's right and when it's wrong. And then uh, white just in general. If you have white walls, white clothing, things like that, it's very obvious if your light isn't producing a great white. So the rule of thumb has been like, hey, look for something over 93. And then people said CRI isn't a good measurement. So we went on a TLCI. But that's kind of a breakdown. It is kind of long-winded. I'm sorry, guys. But that's kind of a breakdown of what when you're looking for an LED light, especially these cheaper ones, things to be careful of because uh, some, some companies just slap on some LEDs and they kind of smudge the numbers on their ratings and say, it's a good light. And then you get it and you end up with pink faces. So it's always good to talk about some of that stuff because we forget that uh, that <laughs> these terms are, are slapped all over everything and that they, they don't always get defined very well when people are actually looking for information. Now, speaking of defined, Apple has defined a new standard in video editing with the latest version of Final Cut. Uh, Devin, I know you put the, the, I think you put this in there. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure I did. And I, would. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch Final Cut Pro. Um, I know a few people who have mentioned that the quick sync implementation of that is really awesome. Uh, as a non Final Cut Pro user, I have not experienced that. It, what's exciting about this? Anything that you're really into that you wanted to just, uh, you know, give this a try? For, it's it why? more, more just to quickly go over it as if you're an up and coming filmmaker or you're getting into editing and you don't have a lot of money um, and but you own Mac products, which I don't know how those two would necessarily coexist, but if that's the case, um, just Final Cut X has really come a long way. I know a lot of professionals poo-pooed it when it first came out, and there's still a lot of things that I think as a professional editor, it has lacking. Now, the Intel Quick Sync does mean that, yeah, in a few ways, it edits faster and it renders faster than other solutions. That doesn't mean that it's the best, though, if it takes you twice as long to get something edited. Uh, there's been a few things that they've done that really helped to improve it for people who are looking for maybe a first time editor or maybe you're a solo editor and you don't need to work with anyone else and you don't need added features of more like Avid software and Adobe and stuff like that. For one thing, their timeline had always been this strange magnetic linking thing, which made it kind of impossible to like put all your dialogue onto a track and then apply effects and EQ and things like that to a track. Um, they now allow for some track-like functionality with their fancy magnetic timeline thing, um, as well as finally introducing things like dual monitor workflow. I know it sounds crazy to mention what? that because that kind of existed in Final Cut 7, but dual monitor was kind of not really well implemented the way they cur they had it before. Now it's kind of like really... That's ridiculous. Yeah, That's considering where Final Cut... Yeah, you could see why everyone hated Holy it. Holy crap. You can see why everyone hated it hated it now. Uh, I mean, DJ wouldn't care because he just edits on a giant 50-inch TV. But uh, also being able to improve audio organization, which is really important for documentary work, being able to organize that audio. Um, and then that improvement for 10-bit Rec 2020, which for those that don't know, is like the new standard um, that for a lot of 4K footage will probably be a part of and things like that in terms of color and brightness and contrast and all High that dynamic stuff. Dynamic range. Oh, dynamic range. That's the big thing right now. And I, I think it's justified that it's a big thing, but it's shows you that they're still improving Final Cut. Um, and while that it may be lacking some professional features, it's $300. And I know that right now Adobe kind of looks attractive with $50 a month, but in one year, that's a lot more than Final Cut X. So it's one of those things to consider. I mean, I know people who edit like crazy, like red footage on Final Cut X. I don't know how. Don't ask me about that workflow. But uh, this is something that, hey, you, you know, if you've got a Mac and you want to get into editing, it's they've made it really intuitive and easy to edit and use the software. While it lacks some of the features, I can't say that it's bad software because I think that it does what it, it's supposed to do. They may be kind of like, I, I feel like they aren't trying to be professional. I feel like the people who are behind Final Cut 7, it's not the same idea and mission statement with Final Cut X. They wanted something low cost. They wanted something that everyone can pick up and use and make great video with, and that's capable on this system. Uh, but for editing, collaboration, and a few other things, uh, you know, we'd always would 
I at least would recommend Adobe as well as Adobe's new update too. The 2017 just came out. I've been having a lot of fun with it. And DJ, have you used 2017 yet for Adobe? I, I did just install it. Um, one of those things I want to mention about the new 2017 is that it finally solved my memory leak issue on nice. both of my laptop and my desktop. That was really just driving me nuts. I can now open old projects and I, I don't have that problem anymore, which is very refreshing because that was extremely frustrating having to rebuild old timelines or go to an older version to open it. I haven't dug into what's new in 2017. Devin, it sounds like I, you have. <laughs> I, I, I have a little bit. I haven't even gone through the videos and the release notes yet, but actually one that client I was telling you where we went through and edited ums and ohs all day, um, the oh. previous <laughs> editor, because I wasn't responsible for that edit, but the previous editor who made the rough cut actually did it on 2017. Luckily, I had it installed. I was prepared prepared and I tested it and it worked, but it got me to use 2017 in real time with a client, which I wasn't exactly a fan of, uh, especially because I had some problems with encoder. But the one thing that I noticed in my usual workflow that sprung out right away, and I don't know about you, DJ, but have you ever uh, in a, a Premiere, not Audition, uh, done their like adaptive denoising plugin where it kind of has like a simple minus DB, you turn it down a little bit and it tries to find hiss and things like that and bring it down? No, maybe not. Okay, I always go to audition, or I use a noise gate, and, and that's the way you should do it, band. kids. That's the way you should do it. But what they've done now is now that little denoising plugin, which I want to say was probably from about CS3. Yeah, it was awful, useless. <laughs> They've replaced it with the adaptive denoising plugin from Audition, like point for point, all the meters, all the sliders, everything else. So I'm expecting that a lot more of the audio is uh, direct plugins from Audition, which should also mean, too, that if you're doing a rough cut in Premiere and you're taking to Audition to master, that should be much more of a seamless process, which I love seeing. So I noticed that right away because that made a huge difference in what I was currently editing, um, as well as uh, there was a problem with Premiere. I, did, I went to do an export and... Uh, or encoder an encoder uh, said that it was missing videos. It did that red frame of death where like really it's like the media is offline, but Premiere was currently editing and using the media and the media was fine. And I tried restarting the system, restarting the software. I, it could just be an isolated bug with that one project. Uh, but I ended up exporting straight out of Premiere just because I figured that would work and it did work. So this is something I still need to work through and I need to check for bugs, see if that's my fault or if that's a bug I need to submit to Adobe. But Still, uh, I, so far, it's cool. It looks better. I, I don't know if you've seen the interface. It's been redesigned a little bit, and it's kind of nice to have a refreshing look on your edit suite. I'm um, one of those people that has it set to go back to C CS 5.5 every <laughs> time you log in. So even with the new uh, 2017, like it reverted back to my sure. prehistoric uh, animal view. <laughs> um, I, I don't normally go to the Adobe Encoder because mm -hmm. I deal with a lot of very large projects and I find that the wait time while it's doing its audio processing before it finally sends the information over to Q in Encoder uh, is long enough that it makes me fear that my project might not end up making it. Whereas if I do it inside of Premiere, uh, I don't have any problems with that. It just starts going right away and you can see uh, the progress. Uh, I've sent feature length projects to Encoder before and you'll actually get a delay of up to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. not, not like seconds, minutes before encoder actually looks like it's even doing anything uh, to the files and you you're like well what the hell is going on well in reality it's it's doing the pre-renders for the audio in the background before it starts but since it doesn't show you anything you think the software is locked up and and maybe right. if there was some sort of scrolling indication like there is in premiere i would have more faith in it but i only use uh, I really, honestly, I only use encoder for uh, folder monitoring and transcoding options. Uh, you, you set up a folder, you dump your footage in there for something that's like a little bit wacky or you need 1080p from 4K, bam, sure. and it, it takes care of all the rendering in the background for you. But I don't use it for uh, regular Premiere rendering. <laughs> okay, well, and, and too, it's different workflows for different people. I do a lot, but a lot of what I do is smaller videos. And part of the reason why I do it is because one, I usually need to get started on another video while that's running and Encoder allows you to kind of have that background process going. And then secondly, I kind of like the fact that I get a video preview while it's rendering. Um, as bad as it may be, I kind of use it as a quality check. If like 
like I'm really pushed up against a deadline, I usually miss one or two things. And if I'm watching the render as it's happening, sometimes I can catch things that I go, oh, I forgot that and cancel it, go back and do a quick fix. So um, even though that's kind of a bad <laughs> way to do things in general, uh, sometimes I appreciate having that video preview. I kind of wish Premiere would have a video preview showing, hey, this is the frame I'm laying down on the hard drive uh, just so I can get an idea of what the final product's going to be. So to, to each their own. The big thing that encoders use for now is proxies, though. I don't know if you've gotten into that, the automatic proxy and replace that Premiere does for ingest. No, um, I haven't tried that yet. <clears throat> is it smooth? Oh, absolutely. Like, you don't even think about it. You just start a new project, you set up ingest, and you say, okay, make these Cineform. Because you know how H.264 has terrible timeline performance? Like, yeah. if you scrub your timeline, it's like, there's, yeah. So, uh, by saying ingest settings, I say, like, Cineform 720p, and now, like, my editing laptop can, like, go through, you know, what would be 4K footage like butter, and you just add a little button on your video preview monitor that switches from proxy on and off, and bam, like, with, with just as uh, you start editing and it's stuttering while you first start editing because it's kind of proxying in the background and then once it's done it automatically switches it over and you just don't even realize it it's just huh. smooth and then you just go to render and it uses the raw files and it's just so it's one of those things that especially if you have low-end laptops or you have really big projects and um you know you're trying to do motion graphics and all this other stuff that can go a long way in helping that and it does seem to support proxies i did an export from the timeline over to Adobe Encoder, and Adobe Encoder seemed to pick up on the proxy as well. And I forget why maybe I didn't use it, if there was a problem with it or something was wrong. But um, it seems that even that dynamic linking is being improved in terms of this file has a proxy attached to it, and when you take it to other software, it'll use that proxy as well. So It's, it's always interesting. Uh, Devin and I, when we were at uh, NAB last year, we got to stand over each other's shoulders and see uh, how <laughs> each of us edits. And it's like... Um, I don't know. It's like watching someone go to the bathroom. You're like, uh, which you know, you're, you're gonna fold the toilet paper. You're gonna crumple it. What the hell are you doing? What's wrong with you? This is freaking me out, man. And Devin's the same way. Like, uh, I opened up a new instance of Premiere, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, I had never xed out the little uh, file explorer. And he's like, "Are you kidding me? You use file explorer to find your files?" I'm like, "No, no. I, I just dump my media in there." Like, "Oh, thank God, thank God, you're not that person." It's, it's again, it's a little ridiculous. Uh, you you get so passionate during editing that you start to form really strong opinions about how you edit, <laughs> and then it's heresy. Anyone who does it different, I know it's like uh, it's it's really rough. And I I almost I'm glad that when I do work with remote editors that uh, they send me their pre edits and then I go through and get to edit by myself as opposed to dealing with uh, that mess. Uh, I am interested to dig in further to uh, 2017. I think they've updated Next some week. features. Uh, no, I've I've pretty sure I installed it. Uh, well, no, I'm just saying next week we can talk about it because I need oh, to yeah. do too. Yeah, definitely next week I would like to talk about it. I want to mess around. Uh, they, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's some After Effects updates as well as uh, Audition yeah. as well. Uh, and I think even Photoshop and Light, Lightroom got some updates. Although I think Lightroom's was just uh, the library management system and uh, some more file supports because there was an update to uh, raw support here with 2017 to encompass a couple more cameras. Uh, maybe the Fuji. Is that striking a bell? You, you Fuji? Eh, no. Because eh, no. I'm not on okay. the photography side, yeah. All right, on the next thing on the list, because we spent a lot longer on editors than I expected, uh, let's talk about these lights. Uh, you've actually got two sets of lights you wanted to talk about, Devin, and I'm going to let yeah. you dive into them. I haven't been paying attention to either one of these. 3000 to 500 or 5000 3000 to $5,000? These uh, That seems right? pretty yeah. pricey. Uh, that is pretty pricey. What the heck is going on with these uh, Stella yeah. kits? So these kits, a uh, little bit of background, because we, me and DJ actually saw them at uh, NAB for a bit, even though we didn't get a lot of spend a lot of time with these guys. Um, this is the first time they're doing kits, which kind of brings down the cost if you're looking to buy multiples, and that's why this is kind of cool, and I'm talking about it right now, because these lights have been out for a while. You can check out reviews on them and everything else. Uh, they started out, the company that makes these lights, by making diving lights. So what makes these lights really interesting is it has that built-in battery, and it has, in generally case, almost all of them have uh, totally waterproof. You can dunk them in water, it doesn't matter. So if you're documentary, your news, your broadcast, and you're, you find yourself in the snow and the rain and everything else, having a light that one is like battery powered, and then two, it's kind of designed for rough housing and everything else can be really important. And the size of these lights is really insane. Um, to me, it's kind of like, I put it in the comments there, it's kind of like a new lull kit, 
because I feel like everyone's moved, uh, if, if this may be before people watching this show, but when people were using mini DV cameras, the de facto standard for like small end video production was a lol kit, yep. which was which was like one hard light that had a little bit of focusing to it and uh, like one um, halogen or like kind of wide light that would be your fill light. And then I think another like smaller point light. And, and that was kind of like the kit and you had a big bag for it and it, it was very hot and you use gloves and everything else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the kind of kits they're showing here make me kind of think of that as like a high quality. These lights are bright. Uh, they include some battery power. Uh, they come with lots of little adapters and things you can throw on the front of it. But uh, part of it too is just the design of it. Uh, you can see some videos on how these work, but generally speaking, that light has a big switch on top and that switch isn't designed as like it looks like a fader like it's going to be for dim control or something like that but it's not it's just a big actuation to like dim it up so if you want to dim it up you actually like slam it a few times the whole idea behind it was when you're diving you're wearing a wetsuit and crap and it was a way to sw change the light while you have gloves on um, this becomes important because if you're doing something like, say, shooting in Chicago where it gets extremely cold, you generally want to keep your gloves on. So being able to like adjust and set up your lights while you have gloves on, it sounds like a small thing, but sometimes like it can make the difference between like a great day of shooting and one that you regret. Um, so uh, all those things considered, yeah, they are pricey, but uh, they're extremely bright. I, there's it's very. I haven't found a light this small that is this bright before. I've seen bigger ones with fans and everything else, but uh, that is what's so impressive is this big giant light uh, coming out of such a small package. And then on top of that, um, you know, bringing the price down by being a kid and everything else is really great. It's one of those that's kind of like on my wish list, uh, but uh, I haven't exactly. It's hard for me to justify yet. Three thousand dollars, man. I mean, you could buy some pretty decent flat panel kits. I mean, it wouldn't be as portable as this, but uh, really, that's that's a pretty decent investment. It, it, There's so many other good options for that price. There, there is, but I see this as a light kit that will survive for the next 25 years. So it's that kind of an investment uh, as opposed to some of the other, you know, stuff that if it gets wet, it's going to fry and it's going to break and everything else. So um, now if it is a long-term solution, so far it has shown to be the product that they've been, they've been doing this with diving kits and everything else for quite a long time. It's a very well-established company. It's just they're new in the video making space than necessarily the underwater photography space. So... In general, though, it's one of those that if I had the money, this would kind of be a kit I'd be looking at purchasing compared to some of the other kits that are out there uh, just because it's so um, it's just great light that comes off of it. Huh. So the next light on the list, and I'm not interested in those lights at all. Can you tell? I'm sorry, <laughs> Devin. I'm not, I'm not trying to run right. you under. I, I was a little interested in the weird ball adapter and how that actually works because I, I saw that in the pictures. Yeah. But otherwise, uh, nothing nothing really exciting there, especially <laughs> with the price. Uh, this one's a little bit better price, uh, similar configuration, not for underwater diving. Uh, what is this new Cam TV Boltson 55? Well, this Boltson uh, 55. Am I saying that right? Boltson is... So. Don't okay. ask me, dude. Don't ask me. So Came TV, we're kind of familiar with these guys. Uh, they've been on eBay before and stuff like that. Uh, so they have a few models of this light. Uh, the 55 uh, watt is what we're seeing here. And that one goes for, uh, I think, 250 288 something like that. A little short of $300. They also have a 350 watt, which I think is 20 bucks cheaper. Uh, what's cool about these is that they actually have a Fresnel lens on the front of it. Now, this kind of looks similar to the aperture. Uh, the aperture doesn't have a focusable beam. The aperture is just an open uh, light element. And in this case, they actually put a lens on top of it. And not just that, you can actually focus it and adjust uh, that front element further from the light source in order to narrow the beam or widen the beam. I really like that. What else I like? It's got barn doors on it. Uh, it's a hard light source and you can cut it hard. I like that. It's got a mount for Sony MP built into the bottom of it, really convenient. So someone needs to hold the light or you're, you know, kind of tucking it away in a tight place. Uh, there's not a like bunch of cables and crap coming off of it. I really like that. Um, having a built-in four pin XLR power adapter so that you can use a DTAP from a bigger battery if you need to run it at full power for a couple of hours. You can do that. I like that. I really like the fact that it's got a Bowen adapter. So you can put on giant, like, 10-foot soft boxes. I'm not sure how well that would work with a 50-watt light. But still, you can do it if you want to. All those things considered, along with, you know, of course, the usual LED stuff of being able to dim it. Um, for me, it's just a that's... Wi-Fi app? Is there, there, I'm seeing a Wi-Fi app in this uh, literature here.
Uh, yeah. You can actually yeah, control apparently, multiple lights. Apparently there's like a Wi-Fi thing. I have not checked into it. I haven't been able to see like what the app looks like, what the usability would be like. For me, that feels sketchy. It's nothing against Cam TV. Um, but like Aperture has this really great remote system setup that works with all of their lights. And after using it a couple of times, um, minus the fact that maybe once or twice you'll press power and it won't like turn off immediately or something like that. Sometimes it needs to like, you know, like kind of click first and then it starts working fine. Yeah. Um, the Aperture system works great. No problem. Uh, this system, I don't know because it doesn't seem to be an emulation of that system. Uh, it, so it, it's one of those where I just don't know where it's coming from. They aren't advertising how it's to be used. It's just on the spec sheet. So I don't know what to make of it yet. But uh, with the little micro USB, I'm assuming that that's to update firmware or other things like that so that they can keep uh, updating the app or the way that the app interfaces with this light. So that's cool. Um, but Cam TV, I've also seen them make some like really big LED lights and then after a year or two, stop making them. So I just don't know what long-term is, where as opposed to something like Aperture, they've been using that same remote they came out with like five years ago for like their, you know, Aperture light storms and stuff yeah. like that. Like they've kept the standard and, I, and that's really important because then it makes me like believe in the fact that if I need to buy an extra remote or I get another light from them, it's not going to be like, oh, now you got to carry around a bunch of remotes. Well, I think the, isn't the Aperture remote uh, just a, D, what is it, DMC or DCM, whatever the, the DJ light yeah, controlling yeah, the system. DMX. It's, DMX, thank you. It, I believe it's a DMX system over 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, so it's sending DMX commands inside of a 2.4 gigahertz signal. Um, as far as I can tell, there's no like encryption or handshaking between it. I think it just broadcasts 2.4 gigahertz. And when the light sees the channel and uh, the... Um, it's channel, yeah, that it's on, it goes, okay, I'll turn off. Because the Aperture Remote has A, B, and C, and then it has four channels, I think, per group. Yeah, group and channel. So that comes out to 12 different individual ones. But if you know these two lights are going to just work in tandem, you can set them to the same channel in the same group, and then you can control a crap ton of lights with one remote. So I don't know. I feel like we've hit, and hit peak Wi-Fi with some of this stuff. Uh, I would yeah. almost rather see... You know, it's pretty lame, but and I know I'm an old man, but an IR blaster on some of these lights, because really, when I want a remote control of my lights, I want it for lights that are hung so high up that I can't, you know, physically get to them to make the adjustment. Because sure, it'll take me almost as long to get the app out, start it up, fire it up on my phone, tablet or whatever, and then dink around with it, and then make sure that I'm logged into each of the lights, where I could probably just walk over to the light, make the adjustment, or, or yell, hey, you, and, <laughs> you know, get somebody that's behind there to do something with it. Do we need Wi-Fi I in all these things? Well, see, with an app, I really am not sure about the app thing. With something like the the Lumi Cube, because we talked about earlier that Wi-Fi, uh, that kind of makes sense to me because it's a small package. There's limitations. And I kind of see it as being like a solo shooter. I'm out maybe shooting skateboarding videos or something like that. Like, I, I, I'm kind of okay with that because I see that as a necessary evil as opposed to the Aperture system where they just, there's no app. There's none of that. It's like, here's a hard remote and they're cheap and they give you one in every light with every light and it's like and it works on any of them and there's no pairing with it or anything like that i love that system it just works um in a system like this where like my you know, a couple of of fresnel lights or something like that requires an app to like log in and all this other crap i mean apps can be good and bad we've seen the original Yi app for their action cam before the 4k was complete garbage and some of the firmware on that camera too i think was also pretty weak uh but then you know when the 4k came out they made huge improvements and now on the last show with mitch you're talking about live streaming with it like they've you know there's their apps can be good and they can be bad i try to avoid apps because if i'm out shooting in like crazy dusty or wet situations i want to keep pulling out my phone in order to set up lights and stuff like that so to each their own but that's kind of where i'm at with it uh, you know the the luma cube that we're talking about that little tiny light i did yeah. play around with the app once or twice but it's so much easier to just click the top you know and uh a lot of times i just want lights on and off i don't really yep. if i need to dim them i'm gonna do that while i'm looking at whatever i'm looking at i'm not gonna try and wi-fi remote control them from five feet away really I, I have feet i can foot no, zoom dude, my body dude. over to the camera or over to the Maybe. light 
maybe I'm too lazy, but just in the past two weeks, I did two interview where I kind of set up the lights where I, I liked them. And then, I mean, I did run around and like kind of adjust them a bit and stuff like that. But then once I was looking through the camera, I just would watch the camera while I pulled out my remote and kind of like messed with the dim a bit. And so I could kind of get that ratio on the face exactly where I wanted it to. Then I'm like, I'm good to go. And I hit record. So you know, I mean, <laughs> I've got these long arms that I can just reach over to the lights and touch them. I'm not sure. quite as short as you, so <laughs> maybe uh, I'm, I'm using my tall people advantage here is probably what's going yeah. on. Uh, so that was the lights. Uh, we got one more thing to talk about, and that's the Kronos uh, high frame rate camera. Uh, to be honest, before we dive into this, I just want to let you guys know, neither Devin or I are an open source expert on high frame rate cameras. I just saw this. It looks interesting. It's kind of been talked about for a while, and we're talking about a pretty crazy recording slash frame rate system i mean these frame rates are nuts and this thing is going to be in a price range of twenty five hundred dollars Devin, you've read the news article as well as i have and really guys that's all we're regurgitating here because <laughs> we've not messed around with this uh, 1050 frame per second camera uh, what is this what do, what do we need it for and uh, is this going to be the next like uh, super slow-mo guys part doer like yeah um, exactly well, that's that's part of it, right? Because uh, we there is an established standard for high speed considered in broadcast and things like that, and that's usually the uh, the flex cameras, like the Phantom Flex, and among other things. What I really like seeing here is that um, a lot of those uh, high speed cameras don't put a whole lot of color science into their cameras. They're just about the spec sheet. They're about how many frames can you do at what resolutions and how long can you do it? Because high speed cameras need RAM. They can't just record to an SD or to a hard drive or something like that because the data rate is so large. Uh, in this case, You've got, um, they say, possibly up to 32 gigabytes of RAM, uh, which is pretty substantial. Um, it's hard without knowing exactly what kind of format they're shooting and if they have any compression, what that's going to mean for runtime. But in any case, for me, I love seeing this because there's no reason why open source and other platforms can't create high-speed cameras, considering that uh, a lot of them don't necessarily put color science into it high speed footage kind of is such a beast to work with when you talk about these speeds it's one thing if you shoot like 100 fps on your panasonic or your sony uh but on this camera it's such high frame rates you know you're going to be doing a lot of work tweaking in post anyway so asking for someone to color footage or something like that isn't yeah it's kind of like within the realm of uh how you use this um well, but what, if you think about it though Devin, i mean really if you're going for a high speed shot are you really worried about color? You know, it's more the coolness of, you know, seeing water oh, droplets yeah. move at a <laughs> billionth of a second or what have you, as opposed to uh, full speed. And I think really no one would be that upset if you, you weren't no. getting good quality Kodak out of each of the images. True. But I think what what's really the driving point, and I'm not a high speed guy, so I, I can't say exactly um why this is a really good solution for the price point. But what I see is the fact that it doesn't need a PC for operation. It can pull straight down to a hard drive on its own. Most guys I see who run around with cameras are running around with MacBook Pros or alike so that they can actually move the footage from the RAM into a hard drive. Um, and so being able to see that, hey, this thing will do, uh, it looks like slightly over 720p footage at over 1,000 FPS is really impressive. Um, and the numbers, the spec sheet in general, being able to use USB drive, a few other things is really impressive. Uh, it, other than that, like there isn't much to say because it looks like it records raw and it records it fast. And as long as your lenses are good and you have enough light for it, my God, you need light, uh, you, you're going to come out with great images. So I just, I like to see that there isn't going to be just the king of flex controlling high speeds and bringing high speeds down where like guys who are doing smaller commercial projects or uh, independent films and things like that, high speed is like an actual option as part of your, you know, way to tell stories. Especially too, you consider like renting this uh, if this is something that ends up in rental houses, way cheaper. Like you're talking about maybe like 50 to 100 bucks for a day. Uh, that's super cheap yeah. to get a couple of those crazy shots you want to get compared to something like a flex where most of the times because the flexes are so expensive, you're renting an operator with it because it's so crazy expensive and everyone's scared of it breaking. So, 
Yeah, it's high speed stuff. I've n- never ventured into that range. You know, maybe pushing it a little bit to sixty or one hundred frames per second, but never anything nuts like that. Uh, it's cool, and some of the videos you see are amazing. But uh, I don't know. To me, <laughs> as a it's a lot of work. As, yeah, it's a lot of it's a lot of work for very little payoff. And then <laughs> you look at what kind of story you're gonna tell with that and most of the high speed stuff i see is more scientific application or engineering engineering yeah exactly like pressure strengths breakdowns explosives uh discharge stuff like that but as far as actually telling a story like it's really cool to look at but it doesn't really (laughs) accomplish anything unless you're doing an educational setting where you're like, okay, you know, you need to see this plastic emulsify at X number of degrees when an arc crosses over it uh, from like a switching application that's happening over here, or this safety device needs to withstand this much impact. And like, we want to watch the tensile strength as it goes through each of these like motions of the ball hitting and pin- pinning and sure. all that business. Uh, but well, yeah, can I, you I think get... of a compelling story you need to tell with this? No. Cause I mean, I can't. Sure. Um, in in terms of story, uh, in terms of direct application of story, I get that that's a hard argument to make. For me, though, I just kind of consider it like um, a rush did a whole lot of high speed slow mo. A lot of like you see individual raindrops falling onto uh, the car and the road and everything else. Yeah. And I see um, a lot Could of possibility. Could you better serve in- that with CG? Uh, possibly, but it's one of those that comes down to cost. This would be a lot cheaper than making convincing situation via CG. I think in a lot of in a lot of different areas, as well as like music videos, I see this being very popular for. There's a lot of music videos where, uh, you know, people trying to do the matrix effect. I see them using GoPros at higher speeds trying to do a matrix effect. And it's one of those where you can always kind of tell because, you know, the GoPro kind of looks like a GoPro. It's really hard to get away from that GoPro look when you're shooting with them. Um, I see this as being kind of an option for you're doing a really cool music video and you want to show like a cool burnout in the music video or something like that. It's one of those kind of stylistic things you can throw on top. And it's that extra production value that maybe, you know, helps to, you know, make a more complete package. It's just one of those that it brings it into the realm of like average guys can kind of do this stuff as opposed to like well if they're not spending 50,000 on your you know friggin music video you can't expect to have high speed like that so I'm just trolling you I don't really I mean there's probably (laughs) tons of ways to to actually use high speed that are excellent and you're right music videos uh, you can always uh, drop a grape (laughs) into some water at high speed you know everybody will love that it's just amazing On that note, Devin, I think we've run through pretty much everything in the show notes today. Uh, Sorry, folks, if the shows have been sporadic. I've been hotel living for the last week and a half, and Devin and I had some computer issues as well as scheduling issues to deal with. Uh, Hopefully, Mitch will be back on Friday, and Devin again next Sunday if everything goes accordingly. Devin, do you have anything else to add before we get out of here? Uh, Get out there and shoot. Yeah, shoot, (laughs) shoot, film, whatever you can. Shoot everything. Well, don't shoot anything film everything uh, we don't need any more violent crimes out there folks just uh, uh film as much as you can tell your stories uh make some mocking commercials i'd love to see some of those uh and there's a lot of good jokes in that political spectrum right now that could be used uh, yeah. on that note guys you can find me at dslrfilmnoob.com at dslrfilmnoob on twitter you can find this podcast on soundcloud itunes and anywhere podcasts are distributed Devin, where can people find you you can find me on twitter at devocut I'd love to start a conversation. Yes, and uh, you know you're working on all this stuff. Let's see some posts, man. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna no, dive I in and post in like the past three days. You've just been busy moving. You haven't noticed. No, true. Good point. Good point. On that note, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on another exciting episode of DSLR Film Noob Podcast. This is where the music goes in. I don't have a sampler today because I'm in a hotel. Actually, I'm at my house. But No, you're completely at your house. <laughs> yeah, I know. And the sampler is right here. I just couldn't find a cable. Um, I, I do go back out for hotel living all next week, so that is going to be great. Um, so when I have nothing else to do, there's no bar near my hotel. I've been building these intricate Legos. Uh, there's a generic, and this is completely not camera related at all, but, uh, since we're still on here, let me show you these, Devin, they're ridiculous. Uh, they're made by some, uh, a Chinese company that maybe is cloned Legos somehow, or, you know, uh, they're not real Legos cause they're a quarter of the size. Uh, but, uh, 
the pieces take so long to build that it can kill an entire evening. Uh, here is one right here. Wow. Uh, it doesn't even say R2-D2 on it. It's, of it's course. Like, it's called like DIY a white zone DIY robot droid. or something. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, they're fun. Uh, this is like 600 pieces, and you can kill an entire evening. you got action Damn. figures, and uh, uh, I built uh, a few of these already. I've got like six packs of them laying in my hotel room oh, waiting man. for my return. Now I want some. I know there's there, <laughs> uh, a few people I know, including some of the guys I work with, were making fun of me. And then when I brought one in, they're like, "Oh, how much was that?" And it's like it's eight dollars, seven dollars to buy one of these kits. <laughs> so it's there. And then you, you can buy. They have group kits where you, like maybe you want old retro video games. You can buy seven of them for like thirty bucks or twenty bucks. So then it's less than five dollars a pop for them. And you know if you spend an evening messing around with it, you've gotten your money's worth out of it. And they yeah. look really cool as tchotchkes on your desk. So uh, <laughs> there you go. More and, desk toys. Yeah, well, it's weird, too. I'm, I'm working a fixed schedule of 7 to 3.30 uh, for the next four weeks. So being off at 3.30 and not having any, like, overtime or uh, rush orders or anything like that to work on, it's like just hanging out here. Yep. No bar. Uber it over <laughs> to a bar, sit there and build my Lego sculpture and go back to my small hotel room and stare at four walls. Yay. Yay me. Awesome. <laughs> All right, on that note, guys. I think uh, I'm going to end the live broadcast now. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye.